you to the fourth in the series of special lectures at the Center for Advanced Study. Uh, tonight, you're in for a special treat, as we're about to hear from one of this nation's foremost historians, our own Fred Hoxie. Uh, th this series actually uh, began over a glass of wine with uh, Bill Greeno and myself uh, when we talked about the importance of having uh, um, the uh, excellent scholarship on our campus uh, brought to the public. And uh, we began this a few years ago, and I'm, I'm very pleased uh, and that Fred has agreed to be part of this. Dr. Hoxie is a Swanland Chair and Professor of History. He holds an appointment in the College of Law and is an affiliated faculty member in the university's American Indian Studies program. Fred is a founding trustee of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian and the author of several books on American policies towards Indians and a study of Montana's Crow Indians, among other works. In one of many impressive accomplishments, Fred recently curated a Newbury Library ex exhibition, Lewis and Clark and the Indian Country, which toured five Native American communities that had contact with the Corps of Discovery. His general editor of the American Indians, a 23-volume series of books published by Time Life, which has sold more than two million copies, and he is series editor with Neil Salisbury, for Cambridge Studies in American Indian History, published by Cambridge University Press. In 2006, Houghton Mifflin published a Native American history text co-authored by Professor Hoxie, David Edmonds, and Neil Salisbury, entitled The People, A History of Native America. I could go on, but then you'd have to listen to me instead of him no, to summarize. But Fred does not lack credentials, is the short message. I think about this almost daily. You come to a great institution, as I did about a decade ago, but you only understand why it is great after you meet the people, people like Fred Hoxie. I've learned about the character of Fred through both incidental conversations and more focused conversations about the issues we at this university have grappled with recently. One of the things I've been most impressed about Fred with is not just the sincerity of his arguments and the impeccable intellectual basis for them, but the generous and sensitive manner in which he searches for the human dimensions in the chaos of controversial storms. He's been a voice of reason here at Illinois, and he understands how important it is not to demonize people who are trying to reach a certain outcome. Frankly, that's not always been true in the dialogue that we've had over the last decade. Through it all, Fred has stood out as a beacon of hope, a lighthouse, really, through his actions and words. Here is a quote from Fred about the history of Native Americans in the United States. I like this quote because it says just as much about the caliber of the person saying it as the subject he knows so well. What the Indian story says is that people are not subsumed by the United States. People don't disappear into the United States. The United States is at its best when it supports and promotes the rights and freedoms of all communities. And the United States is diminished when the rights and freedoms of these communities are ignored and when these people's voices are ignored. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a good friend and colleague, Professor Fred Hoxie. Thank you. Well, it's a real treat to be here. I'm honored to be part of this series, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's always a treat to have people uh, here to hear uh, what I've been thinking about lately, uh, about the first Indian lawyer. It's also, I realized this afternoon, this is the first day in over a week where I have been grateful that the Cubs are not in the playoffs. Uh, so there's no guilt of being here tonight. Well, I want to tell you a story about an Indian lawyer and about Indian law. But the fancy title for this address, the Chancellor's Lecture, prompts me to frame my story with a few comments about where a story like this fits into the work of historical research at an institution like this. And I think it's fitting, uh, given Richard's uh, introduction. So I want to say a couple of things very briefly 
about history and historical interpretation to really sort of get us thinking about this uh, topic. Um, first, a point about history and society. Uh, the current issue of Academe magazine, the magazine of the American Association of University Professors, carries an article in it about a controversy that's erupted in Utah following the Utah Valley State College's decision to invite, to invite the filmmaker, Michael Moore, to speak on its campus. In the aftermath of protests from Moore's local critics, the president of the Utah State Senate, in whose hometown the college is located, declared that, quote, this institution reflects the values of the community in which it resides. And if we have efforts to move this institution away from the values of the community, well, then we're going to have some problems in the state capitol. The senator's threat is emblematic of the ongoing tension between academic institutions founded to explore new and sometimes disturbing ideas and the desire of ordinary citizens to live comfortably within, the, within a fixed set of community values. For the most part, people live with this tension because they understand that disturbing ideas can be tested and examined, and if they pass scrutiny, new ideas can become less threatening and they can even produce benefits for the entire society. Now this tension between scholarship and society is less comfortable when, dis is less comfortable when disturbing ideas occur outside the realm of the natural sciences. The proof of a disturbing idea's worth is less certain less certain, say, than trying to measure whether the Earth goes around the sun or, or other, other practical, observable facts. Ideas about war and peace or about a society's past, ideas that can be disturbing, require extended debate, engagement, and reflection. We've witnessed a good deal of this tension over the past decade or two, particularly when scholars have proposed new ideas about the national past and about the nature of American society. What often gets simplified as the culture wars is in large part a struggle between new, disturbing ideas and those who believe that those ideas somehow threaten community values. So for historians, historical thinking and historical research, historical interpretation is what we do. And it's where we think we make our contribution ultimately to society. My second point, hopefully also quite brief, the history of scholarship on the American Indian reflects this process of historical interpretation and the evolution of historical interpretation. Over the past generation, Native American history has raised disturbing ideas. For example, the idea that the United States is a racist, indeed a genocidal country. And it has provoked an extended process of debate, engagement, and reflection. This is not surprising, for in addition to making visible previously ignored incidents of bloodshed and massacre, Modern scholarship on the native past has revealed something that is, if anything, even more disturbing than these incidents of violence. It's now clear from this scholarship that the fundamental community value proposed by Europeans when they first entered this continent and clung to by many ever since is incorrect. From Columbus onward, the European invaders and their descendants sought to portray native people as deficient. They had no Christianity, they had no recognizable organized religion, they had no cities, and so on. This central idea of indigenous deficiency fueled distrust, dispossession, and countless civilization programs designed to imbue indigenous peoples with the community values of Europeans. And of course, faith in indigenous deficiency enabled those who dispossessed them to speak of unsettled lands or to characterize American history as an epic journey to settle a continent. I did the exercise with my students a few years ago of looking at covers of textbooks. And they're all about pointing, journeys, movement, and so on, uh, which really, in a way, reflects that, that idea. And it's really triggered by this notion of deficiency. It's deficiency that makes a place unsettled, and so on. So historical research has challenged community values by generating a new set of interpretive ideas. The proposition that Indian people were not backward beings who gave way to modernity or surrendered the continent to superior forces. I see some of my students here, and they all know that one of my uh, watchwords is that nothing is inevitable. To say, well, it was just inevitable, that's always the wrong answer. They were acted upon by European nations. They coexisted with newcomers, even as they were dispossessed, by, by settlers. settlers who renamed their continent and then renamed themselves as Americans. <laughs> 
While disturbing to some, these new interpretive ideas have actually produced a bonanza of scholarship, generating a huge number of new historical problems and questions. How do we imagine encounters between indigenous peoples and outsiders in ways that make the actions of both sides comprehensible to us today? What legacies were generated by this process for native societies and for non-native people? And perhaps most compelling, what about that growing society of intersection where indigenous peoples adapted to the presence of settlers, interacted with them in every arena of life, and created a multiplicity of modern communities? And what do these processes tell us about our previous beliefs, our community values, if you will, about democracy, about nationalism, and culture? So now to my story of James McDonald, with the comment that it is part of a larger project that seeks to answer some of these big interpretive questions about the nature of American democracy and nationalism, and in the process to also push our interpretive efforts into some new areas. Because as in other fields, history is, is no different. New questions and new ideas simply generate further questions and further inquiry. So the story. James McDonald, the first Indian lawyer, the first American Indian to practice law in the United States, was born in Hines County, Mississippi in 1801. The same year Thomas Jefferson became president of the United States and Napoleon Bonaparte was consolidating his rule in post-revolutionary France. Like those two more famous leaders, McDonald seemed a man of the new century. By the standards of his community, he was wealthy. McDonald was the son of a trader and a, a white trader and a Choctaw woman named Molly who owned both land and slaves in the rapidly developing cotton and cattle country of the American Southwest. McDonald was also well educated. His mother enrolled him as a child in a mission school near modern Jackson, Mississippi. But in 1813, she took the extraordinary step of sending him east to Baltimore, Maryland, where the yearly meeting of friends took responsibility for his upbringing. Within a decade, he had been educated in the classics and had been admitted to the bar. By 1823, he had returned home ready to set up a law practice in the, new, in the new state capital of Jackson. In the first years after his return, McDonald's prospects seemed good. Leaders of the United States and the Choctaw tribes sought out his counsel. He appeared to embody the promise of the new American nation, articulate, multilingual, and eager to participate in a rapidly expanding society. He was comfortable in Eastern government offices and drawing rooms and in the forests of his native Mississippi. What is an American, the writer Hector St. John de Creve Coeur had asked in an essay written in the wake of the American Revolution. What is an American? He is an American who, leaving behind him all his ancient prejudices and manners, receives new ones from the new mode of life he has embraced, the new government he obeys, and the new rank he holds. Here, individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men whose labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. It would be easy to imagine that McDonald, McDonald would be just such a figure. But McDonald's life marked a very different course than what Krev Kerr or the Indian Youth's Quaker sponsors might have imagined. Frustration and defeat swiftly followed his early achievements. He found no steady position with either the Choctaws or the American government. His law practice never really flourished. And rather than being celebrated by his fellow Americans as the embodiment of a new national identity, an amalgamation of Native American and European traditions, he watched as aggressive white settlers and their representatives threatened their former allies with destruction if they did not abandon their ancient homelands and move beyond the settled borders of the United States. The clouds appeared to be gathering from every quarter and ready to burst over every fragment of the Indian race, McDonald wrote from home in Mississippi in 1826. I see applications to Congress from half the states in the Union for the extinguishment of Indian titles to land. And to my mind, it looks like a bitter and endless persecution. Most accounts of Indian life in the early 19th century focus on the heroic struggle of John Ross, the Cherokee leader who resisted the Americans until 1838 when he and his tribe were forced west along the Trail of Tears. James McDonald's life is more instructive, I think, though, because his, this lawyer engaged the American settlers on their own terms and a decade earlier, arguing that a democracy, by definition, cannot act arbitrarily to violate the dignity and humanity of its citizens. His words were drowned out by the cries of nationalists who insisted Indians could not be part of the new settler state, 
but, those, but his words lived on to challenge later generations of American leaders. The questions he raised, can the law curb the nation? Can democracy counter colonialism? Lie at the heart of modern American Indian law. And his questions about democracy, colonialism, and the defense of tribal life were also at the center of a political discourse among Native Americans themselves. For the Choctaws, the removal crisis came a decade before the Cherokees were forced west. Surrounded and overpowered, they had no choice but to retreat amidst the frontier chaos of Mississippi. In the course of their removal, the tribe gradually adopted a new approach to their relations with the United States. Diplomatic alliances were replaced with legal contracts. Chiefs were replaced by district and tribal councils. And tribal leaders were compelled to articulate their interests in secular and political terms rather than the ceremonial language of alliance and kinship that had characterized their relations with outsiders during the colonial era. For the Choctaws, as for many tribes who suffered the dislocations of the removal era, this transition to a more legalistic relationship with the American nation state was uneven and divisive. But the tribes that reformed their communities in the West when they were moved west to Oklahoma developed a new political culture that transformed their identities and their approach to outsiders for the remainder of the 19th century. The legal language that failed James McDonald in his struggle with the Americans became the principal resource employed by indigenous leaders in other parts of the country later in the century. Now first a little bit about McDonald's world, the world that he was born into and that he, that he first understood. James McDonald was born into a world in which Native Americans and the United States were diplomatic partners whose relationship was defined by agreements made and celebrated at elaborate treaty councils. In the Southeast, the most important of these to occur in his parents' lifetime took place at the end of December, 1785, near Hopewell, South Carolina. That event concluded the American Revolutionary War in the Southern backcountry and reestablished formal relations with the region's tribes, which until that point had allied themselves with the British. In 1785, both at Hopewell Treaty Grounds and at home, Choctaw leaders wielded spiritual as well as temporal authority. In the words of one recent study, men and women created relationships with foreigners, restored harmony to the family by going to war to avenge the death of kinsmen, sustained others by providing foodstuffs and protection, and observed rituals that sustained the Choctaw world. At Hopewell, the tribe was led by Taboka, a leader who had been representing the Choctaws at international gatherings for a generation. Over the previous 20 years, French, Spanish, and British officials had recorded his presence at Mobile, St. Augustine, Savannah, and Charleston. Following the Hopewell Conference in South Carolina, Taboka and his wife would travel to Philadelphia and New York to meet with American leaders, including Henry Knox, who was Secretary of War, and Benjamin Franklin. The Choctaw delegation arrived at Hopewell in 1785 wearing nothing but, but deer and bear skins. And this was a common ploy in these early uh, treaty negotiations where people would show up hungry and with very little clothes. And the idea was to be welcomed and to create a human relationship before any treaty making, any, any formal negotiations would go on. Taboka insisted that the Americans treat him as a kinsman by clothing and feeding him and his family before the talk would begin. Despite some official grumbling on the American side, the delegates were soon wearing US Army uniforms and eating the Americans' food. The ensuing days were marked by similar discussions of symbolism and substance. Treaty sessions began with invocations of the power of the sun, a power the Choctaws associated both with creation and with the all-seeing eye of the Great Spirit. The conference was also punctuated by numerous references to the importance of family bonds linking the Americans to their native neighbors. Like most Indian groups, the Choctaws imagined their communities as extended families. Foreigners could neither be trusted to keep their promised promises, nor relied upon to be generous in times of hardship, unless they could somehow be transformed from strangers into kin, into family members. This transformation required tribal leaders to adopt the Americans in rituals and in ceremonies. The Americans and Choctaws signed the Hopewell Treaty on January 3, 1786. And on that occasion, the Americans appeared in their dress uniform as well. Taboka and the fellow delegates performed an eagle tail dance before the entire assembly. Covered with white clay, the Choctaws sang and waved eagle tails back and forth over their heads before approaching their counterparts and dancing parts and dancing before them. The Choctaws also carried white poles topped with white deerskins as symbols of peace, 
and presented these to U.S. officials with a white calumet, a pipe. Taboka then kindled a sacred fire in the center of the treaty ground and made a special point of gathering up a few of its coals to take home with him as a record of the event. A friend of mine once said that in, a, that in these gatherings, the treaty was the proceeding, not what was written down on the paper. And this is a good example of that. It was the kinship, it was the relationship, it was the, the event that was the treaty, not necessarily what was written on the paper. After the ceremony ended and the delegations shook hands, Taboka applied the eagle tail to the breasts of the commissioners then covered their seat with two deerskins and laid them under their feet. He explained, these feathers of the eagle will always hold when we make peace. The Hopewell Treaty established peace between the Choctaws and the United States and announced the federal government's recognition of the tribe's control over its Mississippi homeland. According to the language of the agreement, American citizens were not welcome to settle in Choctaw territory. The treaty announced that whites who entered the tribal lands would, quote, forfeit the protection of the United States, and the Indians may punish them or not as they please. At the same time, the document noted that the Choctaws recognized the protection of the new nation while giving their allegiance to no other sovereign and expecting Congress's right to regulate their trade and manage their affairs. The Hopewell Treaty had counterparts in other parts of North America during this period, and this is the period right after the American Revolution with the Spanish on the southern border of the United States, the English and on the west in what's now Louisiana, what then became Louisiana Territory, and the, the British uh, in Canada. In all of these treaty negotiations, which took place in upstate New York, in Ohio, and elsewhere in the southeast, followed this same pattern of a ceremonial uh, creation of a bond and with a recognition of an Indian homeland. These post-war treaties were consciously modeled on the diplomatic encounters of the previous two centuries, when European officials had formed alliances with tribal leaders. Each of these events was at once ceremonial and practical and each was an artifact of a rapidly vanishing world. So MacDonald began his childhood in a world made secure by the Hopewell Treaty and by similar agreements that came immediately in its wake. But as MacDonald grew into adulthood, changes in the Choctaw Territory threatened this stability. First, Mississippi's strategic position shifted when the United States suddenly and unexpectedly acquired the Port of New Orleans and the Territory of Louisiana from the French in 1803. The border of the United States suddenly shifted south, and there was an anchor at New Orleans, and therefore a trade center and a, and a magnet for population. Second, the combined push of, westward push of westward American migration and the pull of plantation agriculture brought a surge of white settlers into southern Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Congress organized Mississippi Territory in 1798, first as a 100 miles wide swath of territory running east from the Great River, and then in 1804 as a broader territory that stretched from Tennessee south to the Gulf. The rapid growth of western Tennessee, accessible by water from the Ohio River as well as from the Mississippi, and the gradual rise of flatboat and steamboat traffic originating in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois also encouraged settlement along the territory's western and northern borders, so people are, are coming in. The dimensions of these changes became clear during the first decade of McDonald's life. Among the most sensitive observers, uh, of the implications of these changes, not just the physical changes, but the meaning of these changes for Americans, were really articulated best by President Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson recon reconciled his benevolent ideas about American Indians with his commitment to American expansion by advocating what he called a program of civilization. And it was really a way of reconciling democratic ideals on the one hand and American expansion and uh, by force uh, on the other. Jefferson did this by arguing that by supporting native education and trade, the government would foster the evolution of Indian social life in the direction of commercial agriculture and Western-style social organization. The president predicted that tribes who incorporated civilized habits, the use of draft animals by male farmers, domestic labor for women, and so on, would eventually abandon their traditional allegiances. Embedded in Jefferson's theoretical speculations, however, was a hard-nosed corollary. It was literally an escape clause, which is the tribes that either rejected this formulation or were unable to change their life ways in the amount of time that the United States specified for them would be forced to go west. So in other words, there was a path opened up for civilization and incorporation, but that path was very clearly prescribed by the United States, and if people didn't conform to it, then this, the Jeffersonian solution was that they should leave and move west. 
When James McDonald left Mississippi for Baltimore in 1813, the borders between the Choctaw homeland and the United States that had been established in 1785 remained in place, but both the physical and political conditions surrounding that homeland had changed. North in New York and the Great Lakes, the boundaries established at the end of the revolution by these other treaties had been breached. The Iroquois homelands in New York were reduced to a series of tribal reservations, while many members of the Six Nations Confederacy that had fought with the British followed their leader, Joseph Brandt, to Canada and the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. In the Great Lakes, American control over the Mississippi led to the rapid expansion of Ohio River commerce and the extension of agricultural settlements along the southern boundaries of what's now Indiana and Illinois. So McDonald grows up in this atmosphere of very shifting uh, political and, and strategic uh, realities and the increasing pressure of this Jeffersonian idea about civilization. Information on James McDonald's education in the East appears first in the memoirs of Thomas McKinney, the Maryland merchant, who was superintendent of the Office of Indian Trade from 1816 to 1822, before becoming the nation's first commissioner of Indian affairs in 1822. McKinney recalled that early in his tenure in Washington, a friend named Philip Thomas, the secretary of the Baltimore Yearly Meeting of Friends, brought the teenage McDonald into his office in hopes of finding the young man a government post. McKinney was an odd character. Among the first in a long line of white officials who presented themselves to posterity as the Indian's friend, many of them have autobiographies with titles like My Friend the Indian and so on, uh, he cast himself as a humanitarian and in many instances he lived up to his own billing. He could stand courageously against those who advocated using force against the tribes, but he also made a steady habit of issuing government contracts to his friends, and he was never shy about using government money to support his own personal projects. Over the next four years, McDonald would be one of those projects. Recalling his first encounter with a young man, McKinney wrote, I soon discovered that there were qualities of both heart and head in this youth of rare excellence and that nature had bestowed on him not only personal lineaments of uncommon beauty, but a manner and action altogether captivating. James McDonald arrived in Washington in the spring of 1818. He was 17 years old. The War Department provided the superintendent with $330 annually for housing and feeding the young man. McKinney took him into his home and paid also for a new suit of clothes. McDonald was soon hard at work in McKinney's office and in a few days, the superintendent could scribble across a letter copied in haste by our little Indian. In January 1819, after about a year there, after lobbying from McKinney and several mission organizations, Congress approved an unprecedented piece of legislation, the Civilization Act, which appropriated $10,000 for, quote, the civilization of the tribes adjoining the frontier settlements. McKinney would be responsible for distributing the funds. The superintendent issued guidelines and set up procedures for doing this. Recipients of these funds, he said, should impress upon the minds of the Indians the friendly and benevolent views of the government towards them and the advantage of yielding to the policy of the government in cooperating with it. Jefferson's idea that civilized tribes would defer to American expansion was now being translated into actual policy. As McKinney's superior, Secretary of War John C. Calhoun wrote confidently in a letter a few months later, our opinion and not theirs ought to prevail in measures intended for their civilization and happiness. And sitting at his desk at the Indian office, James McDonald appeared to be a living advertisement for this viewpoint. McDonald's skill and hard work impressed his superiors. No young man in the district writes, mo writes more or with a more apparent pleasure, McKinney noted at the time. Soon after the Civilization Fund was approved, the superintendent suggested educating the young man to prepare him for a profession. Dipping again into the War Department budget, McKinney enrolled McDonald in an academy in Georgetown run by a local minister. Again, the youth exceeded all expectations. I soon discovered that McDonald was bent on distinguishing himself, McKinney wrote. His book was his constant companion. Carnahan, the headmaster, agreed, noting that he comes to school with his lessons all so well digested and with more Latin and Greek and mathematics in one of them than the class can get through in a week. McKinney witnessed the young Choctaw's academic triumphs for two years. At the George, as the Georgetown course reached its conclusion, the superintendent reported that he raised McDonald's case with Calhoun, who reportedly shot back, make a lawyer of him. 
McKinney dutifully raised the subject with McDonald and eventually arranged for John McLean, an Ohio congressman who was returning to his home near Cincinnati to take up a seat on the state Supreme Court to bring the young man into his law office. And this is a connection I have yet to pursue fully, but McLean later goes on to the Supreme Court and is actually on the Marshall Court that makes the Cherokee decisions uh, a decade later. But he, he, he reads law in McLean's office. The Office of Indian Trade again subsidized McDonald's efforts, and again the young Choctaw performed well. Such was his capacity, McKinney wrote, that in about one half the time ordinarily occupied by the most talented young men of our race, he had gone the rounds of his studies and was qualified for the bar. In the decade James McDonald spent in Baltimore, Washington, and Ohio, war and its consequences had shaped a new reality in the American Southeast. McDonald had left a remote federal territory. He returned to Jackson in 1823, the new capital of a new state. He had left a, a tribal community that maintained diplomatic ties to British traders and Spanish officials in Florida, and which traded across international boundaries as far as from the Atlantic to Spain's frontier settlements in Santa Fe. When he returned, the United States had acquired Florida, and American merchants had opened competing networks of trade. Many of McDonald's Choctaw kinsmen had contributed to this expansion of American authority. This was not something that happened around them that people were not aware of or did not participate in. Their most important service had come during the War of 1812, when US forces faced the dual threat of British bases in Florida and an anti-American uprising among the Red Stick Creeks in what's now Georgia. Fulfilling their responsibilities as allies, Choctaw leaders rallied to the American cause and joined Commander Andrew Jackson in his campaign against both the Rebel Creeks and the tribe's former trading partners, the British. In addition to their military contributions, the Choctaws had also encouraged closer ties to the Americans through their expanding involvement with the region's booming economy and their willingness to welcome Christian missionaries into their communities. Initially, a variety of new business ventures were launched by descendants of the white men who had first entered Choctaw country in the 18th century and served as agents for the exchange of deerskins for guns and tools. Men like Nathaniel Folsom, John Pitchlin, Louis Lafleur, Louis Durant, and Turner Brashears settled in Choctaw country, married into Indian families, and thereby provided their new relatives with, a steady, with steady access to foreign trade goods and producing children whom the matrilineal Choctaws considered natural born members of the tribe. At the conclusion of the War of 1812, the transition from an 18th century world of tribal domains served by traders and protected by distant governments to the dramatically transformed landscape of surging white settlements, cleared forests, and slave labor gathered momentum. The region experienced unprecedented population growth. Alabama exploded during the decade of war, with populations rising from 9,000 to 128,000 from 1810 to 1820. Um, the numbers in Louisiana were similar, and in Mississippi Territory, the figures were smaller, but the American community more than doubled, reaching 75,000 by 1820. For James McDonald's kinsmen, the dangers inherent in this post-war world came vividly into view in the spring of 1819, when their agent, John McKee, received word from Andrew Jackson at his Tennessee plantation, ordering, him, ordering he and his fellow Choctaws to determine whether or not they are disposed to treat with the United States for the sale of all their Mississippi lands. If they were inclined to do so, Jackson reported, he would conduct the treaty negotiations under a mandate from President Monroe. Congress was prepared to convey lands in the west to the tribe in exchange for their territories in Mississippi. Jackson told the agent that this would be the Choctaw's single opportunity to make a deal. Now is the time and the only time when the government will have it in its power to make the Choctaws happy by holding the land west of the Mississippi for them, he declared. And this can only be done by their consent to an exchange in whole or in part. So this language of Jefferson's, which had been a theory at the beginning of the 19th century, here by 1819 is becoming a reality and is coming right to the Choctaw doorstep. Meeting four months later, the tribe's leaders rejected Jackson's offer. Tribal leaders had no interest in leaving Mississippi. We wish to remain here, Pushpataha, Jackson's old comrade in arms, told the agent. And on the poster for this session, the, the large figure is, is, a, is a famous portrait of Pushmataha, who fought with Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans and sat across the table from him uh, four years later at, at Doak Stand. As for selling land in Mississippi, the chief could speak for everyone. 
We have none to spare, he said. President Monroe and Secretary of War Calhoun insisted that the tribe meet, meet with Jackson anyway, and the general, despite his determination, he once said, never to have anything to do again with Indian treaties, agreed to travel south to face, for a face-to-face -face session. When he gathered the Choctaw leaders together in October of 1820 at a spot called Doak Stand, Jackson was blunt. Ignoring the tribe's expanding plantations and cattle businesses that were all around him, he announced, you have more land than you can cultivate. It's useless to yourselves. He added, the president expects no difficulty with his Choctaw children. They had a choice. Those who wish to travel west can live in abundance and acquire riches and independence. Those who chose to remain would be protected by our laws. All parties are accommodated, he concluded, and the interest and happiness of all consulted. There cannot be any honest opposition to the friendly proposals from your father, the president. According to the general, the Choctaw tribe could move west. Choctaw individuals who wished to live in Mississippi could remain behind. Since all parties are accommodated, Jackson insisted, there could be no reasonable objection to the proposal. Refusing the government's invitation, he warned, would mean that the president can no longer look upon you as friends and brothers and as deserving his fatherly protection. If you suffer any injury, he concluded, none but yourselves will be to blame. This was not a negotiation. And it was certainly not an occasion for celebrating the kinship celebrated, established 35 years earlier at Hopewell. The Choctaws must have been aghast. After the opening session on October 10th, the chiefs met in council for a full week, but nothing changed. Jackson had had enough. On October 17th, a week later, he delivered a second blistering address to the tribes, to the chiefs, repeating his charge that opposition to a sale of land could only come from the council of bad men. Jackson then delivered his final blow. If the chiefs refused to cooperate, the government would simply recognize whatever Choctaws assembled in the West as the tribal government. Whoever showed up would be the tribal government. This meeting will be the last time a talk will ever be delivered by your father the president to his Choctaw children on this side of the Mississippi. Your father the president will not be trifled with and put at defiance, he told the group. He ended with a warning. A heavy cloud may burst upon you, and you may be without friends to counsel or protect you. The chain which has hitherto united us may be broken. Listen well and then determine. Your existence as a nation is in your hands. And so this broad sort of philosophy of civilization, that people will somehow become like Americans and will become individuals, is now being implemented here in this, in this uh, negotiation, and in fact is even being forced on them. And this use of the word lang of, of fathers and children, because they are defined as children, the only way they can exist as Indians, as a group, is as children, and therefore they must leave. If they are individuals, there's no real talk here about citizenship and rights and so on, but the idea that individuals who would somehow be able to remain behind, we'll get a little more of that in a minute. The Choctaws met again in council on October 18th, the next day, but could not agree on a course of action. Several leaders, including the principal chief, Puxanubi, left the council grounds announcing that they would have no further contact with the Americans. The following day, Jackson met with about 40 or 50 headmen and warriors and made a deal basically made a deal with a rump group that was behind. The tribe exchanged six million acres in Mississippi, not all of its land, but a huge tract of it, for attractive land in western Arkansas. Jackson's report on the treaty sessions also noted that he made donations, which were really bribes, ranging from $500 to $25 to 23 leaders in order to complete the transaction. For the Choctaws, the tragedy of Doak's Dan came not only from being browbeaten and bribed by their former military ally, but from Jackson's eager grasp of settler rhetoric, the proposition, propositions that would soon repel him to the, propel him to the White House. The general's belligerent logic was ironclad. Indians were backward hunters who by definition did not develop their land. If they were developing it, then they weren't Indians. Native tribes were therefore anachronistic. They could not exist within the boundaries of American settlements. They were by definition not progressive and therefore could not be a part of the progressive republic. Civilized Indians who farmed and owned businesses might live on as individuals within states like Mississippi, provided they obeyed local laws. Jackson never mentioned state citizenship. But civilized tribes did not and could not exist. Eastern tribes like the Choctaws were nothing more than disorganized groups of Indians, he cried, quote, straggling about in every direction. 
whose minds were inevitably poisoned by white men and half-breeds living among them. At Doak's stand, Andrew Jackson portrayed himself as the benevolent agent of a benevolent president and rejected the idea that tribes could live permanently as residents of an American state. Jackson reserved to himself the privilege of defining both the leadership of the tribe and its best interests. His reasoning was self-contained and self-serving. It provided no space for other versions of reality. For the Choctaws, the encounter at Doak's stand marked a brutal confrontation with a new political reality. In the past, Indian communities had often faced powerful opponents and had frequently encountered European diplomats who viewed the tribe as backward and uncivilized. But in the past, Choctaw chiefs and other leaders had been able to correct those misconceptions with force. They could oppose the Europeans on the battlefield or pressure them by forming alliances with powerful Indian neighbors or with rival imperial powers. In 1785, Taboka and his colleagues had earned the Americans' respect and kinship by creating a web of relationships with surrounding powers and an international array of traders, and by protecting the paths leading into the interior homeland. Taboka's diplomatic adversaries at Hopewell had no choice but to bring their guests gifts of food and clothing, and to accept the Choctaw's reciprocal gifts of handshakes and eagle feathers. Andrew Jackson's behavior at Doak's stand marked a fundamentally different moment. It was less important that the general was a military man than that he was articulating a dangerous new version of Thomas Jefferson's philosophy of civilization. Jackson was not simply repeating the second president's statement that Indians should be civilized. He was announcing that the moment of truth and of choice had arrived. Because tribes could not be both civilized and resident within the settler society, they now had to choose between staying as individuals or leaving as a group. Before Doak stand, the Choctaws could rely on diplomats and traders. They could bargain for the price of a wagon road or a right of way or a strip of land. After Doak stand, they were suddenly locked into an arena dominated by white settlers. They faced a ferocious opponent, the hero of New Orleans, who believed formal discussion with tribal leaders was, as he said, an absurdity. After Doak stand, they were surrounded by the logic and rising power of the American settler democracy. After Doak stand, the Choctaws needed something new. They needed a lawyer. So now McDonald re-enters the scene. The 1820 Choctaw Treaty, however unfair, did not end the clamor for Indian land and did not cause Choctaw and other tribal leaders to surrender to the government's advances. The specific issues affecting the Choctaws after 1820 were the status of those western lands granted to them in Arkansas, granted to them but then quickly occupied by white squatters. The government's failure, the government also failed to, failed to provide the money and other goods that they had promised for education. And the state of Mississippi continued to demand more territory and the removal of all of the Choctaws. The tribe requested a meeting with the Secretary of War in the aftermath of 1820. And after several delays, the delegation finally arrived in Washington in November 1824. It included Pukshinubi, the man who had left the treaty grounds in 1820 and refused to agree to a treaty. Um, and Pushmataha, the man on the poster, the American general's former comrade from the Battle of New Orleans, um, and traveling with them, James McDonald, as the group's interpreter. Despite references to white brothers and bonds of friendship, the 1824 negotiations were unlike any previous diplomatic encounter in Choctaw history, and I would argue in, in American history. At first, James McDonald played a minor role in drafting communications between the two sides, but as conversations progressed, his command of English and his skill at framing issues became indispensable. The delegation seized the initiative on major issues, the Choctaw delegation. First, it set aside any further discussion of land sales in Mississippi. In a note in McDonald's handwriting sent to Calhoun during the first week in the city, the Choctaws expressed their friendly disposition toward the United States, but insisted that the wishes of our countrymen preclude any further sales of the tribe's eastern lands. The secretary accepted this statement, and the discussion shifted to the Arkansas Territory. Here, the Choctaws were willing to sell a portion of their territory, provided they received just compensation. For three weeks in November 1824, the two sides negotiated price and method of compensation. McDonald's former patron, Thomas McKinney, now Commissioner of Indian Affairs, communicated separately with the young lawyer, pleading with him to help the government make a deal. But the Choctaws maintained that their comp compensation must reflect the value of what they were selling, and they insisted on cash, 
gifts of trade good, trade goods and other items which had been part of the 1820 agreement were now an artifact of the past. I could make a joke, I guess, about lawyers entering the scene and cash suddenly being the only thing, but I don't think I'll, I'll touch that one. The delegates pressed Calhoun and Monroe to make the best offer. Finally, on November 20th, after several exchanges, they set their terms for the remainder of their stay. Quote, unless the government can bring itself to the conclusion to make a more liberal offer, the delegates wrote, the negotiations must come to an immediate close and the delegation must return to their, the delegates must return to their home. When Calhoun's answer arrived two days later, the Choctaw leaders composed a withering reply. While continuing to express affection for Calhoun, the letter called him our friend and brother, the delegates pronounced the government's offer altogether inadequate. They pointed out that the five million acre tract they were discussing in Arkansas was not remote, as the government had claimed, but easily accessible to, Orla to New Orleans by the Arkansas and Red Rivers. The sale of only one third the total would generate $2 million for the government. It is, is it not just and right, they asked, that we should receive an annuity, a reasonable portion, a reasonable portion of that sum? So they were not dealing with a deficient character here. They were dealing with competent adversaries. The letter went on to set the final terms for an agreement, and after conferring again with Monroe, Calhoun replied again that the Choctaw price was too high. During the ensuing week, as McKinney urged the delegates to reconsider and the group discussed a number of smaller issues, Pushpataha, the tribe's eloquent spokesman, suddenly developed a virulent infection. He died on December 24th. And he's buried in the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Days later, the Indian office made another offer. And while it is impossible to know the details of the Choctaw's internal deliberations, it is likely that McDonald's familiarity with Calhoun and McKinney, he knew them both, together with his ready pen, promoted him to an even more central role than what he had been already playing. The delegation continued to drive a hard bargain. After several more exchanges stretching into late January, the two sides finally agreed to a price of $216,000 for the Arkansas land. They signed a new treaty in Calhoun's office on January 22nd. The bulk of the federal funds would go towards education, and as proposed originally in November, Article 4 of the 1820 treaty, which had called for Choctaw removal, that had been written in by Jackson earlier, was altered to ensure, and new language is added, that said that any change in the status of the Choctaws would occur only with the approval of the tribe. The Choctaws could take great satisfaction from their tenacity and hard work over the previous three months. They had accomplished their principal mission of protecting their Mississippi homeland and of extracting the highest possible price for their Arkansas territory. They had also succeeded in winning a revision of the language of the 1820 treaty, a tacit refutation of Jackson's bullying tactics, and directing most of the tribe's new income to education. Moreover, the negotiation had been conducted in an unprecedented pattern. Written offers had been exchanged and revised, and the delegates had systematically worked through and attended to an extended list of outstanding disputes. But as the Choctaw team prepared to leave Washington, their pride in their achievement was mixed with the realization that the larger predicament of Indian tribes in the American Southeast had, if anything, gotten worse. The 1824 presidential election had taken place just as the delegation arrived in the Capitol. And while Andrew Jackson had not prevailed in the election, where no one won a majority of the Electoral College, he had proven himself to be the most popular candidate in the field. And both the new president, John Quincy Adams, and the new vice president, John C. Calhoun, had been selected by the House of Representatives, were very careful to appear sympathetic to removal. They didn't want to be outflanked by Jackson, who was already preparing for the 1828 election. In mid-February, perhaps with an eye to this rapidly shifting political landscape, the Choctaws published an open letter to Congress. While McDonald was only one of seven signers on the Choctaw Memorial, he was probably its author. Thomas McKinney reprinted the document in his memoirs as evidence of the young lawyer's intellect. And when compared to others of McDonald's writings, it contains a number of familiar themes. The letter was a plea for sympathy and support but it articulated clearly and publicly a simple idea that would become a core element of Native American political thinking down to our own time. In their memorial, the Choctaws observed that the United States was expanding while, tribe, while the tribes were becoming weak. They acknowledged as well that, th that this trajectory suggested that the interposing hand of God was telling them that the time must come when they would be made to become like white men, 
But at the same time, the delegates wrote, the tribe's progress in education and religion give us the consoling assurance that we are not doomed to extinction. Thus, they would become like white men, but they would not cease being Indians. The one great reason for the American success, the Choctaws wrote, has been the great diffusion of literature and the arts of civilized life among them. But instead of viewing the growth of civilized life as a threat or as something opposed to Indian values, the delegation wrote that the advance of the United States should ensure the survival and well-being of the Choctaws. They explained, you have institutions to promote and disseminate the knowledge of every branch of science. You have a government and you have laws all founded upon those principles of liberty and equality which have ever been dear to us. The theory, so our values are what we have in common, they're saying. The theory of your government is justice and good faith to all men. You will not submit to injury from one party because it is powerful, nor will you oppress another because it is weak. Impressed with that persuasion, we are confident that our rights will be preserved. American government and law, the visible symbols of America's commitment to liberty and equality, would prevent greedy settlers and politicians from oppressing the weak tribes living within the borders of the eastern states. The idea was that the United States Constitution would actually preserve Indian rights. McDonald's central assertions that Indians would not become extinct and that non-Indians demonstrated their civilization by remaining loyal to a government and a law that would protect them were crucial and significant observations. Like the negotiations just completed, the statement marked a stunning shift in political consciousness. The leaders of a major eastern tribe, even as they acknowledged that their power was slipping away, were staking their future on the proposition that there was a place for them in the civilized institutions of the United States. And with these words, they were committing themselves to the creation of a new political culture, both for themselves and for other tribes who reached similar conclusions about the American nation and its future potential. Now, there's a lot more to say about the 1820s and the aftermath of this agreement, what happens to McDonald after he goes back to Mississippi, but I think I've tested your patience long enough, and I'm going to fast forward here to the conclusion and to say you can read it all in the book in a few years. It'll make a great Christmas present. Uh, the legal scholar Philip Fricke has written that the place of federal Indian law in American public law can be understood by imagining layers of law with American constitutionalism built on top of American colonialism. Above the colonial line, America has what amounts to a civil religion of, con civil religion of constitutionalism. This constitutional faith may be crushed when the eye drifts below the colonial line. James McDonald's career as a lawyer and as a political activist responding to the American settler agenda marks the point where we can see the juxtaposition of the constitutional line and the colonial line in American law. As an advocate for a tribe that rejected the choice of removal or disappearance, McDonald presumed to create a space in American public law where tribes could stand and resist the settler onslaught. He refused to disappear or to be silent. And he, he really invited a solution. He invited some inventive way to reconcile these two, uh, these two forces of colonialism and constitutionalism. Unfortunately, none has been forthcoming to this point. Again, uh, Professor Fricke, just when and how did all the Indian tribes become part of the constitutional system, he asked. The answer from, from the constitutional text is never. McDonald's memorial marks the birth of federal Indian law, an arena based on the proposition that legal rules and procedures might mediate the process of colonialism. Not only did McDonald in initiate the seemingly hopeless task of representing the objects of colonial expansion in the capital of the settler's republic, but he fashioned the legal arguments that would come to define the Indian law enterprise. As the forces of removal gained power, James McDonald wrote to his patron, James Thomas McKinney, that his exertion on behalf of the Choctaws at the last Treaty Council represented the only incident within the last two or three years of my life to which I can look back with anything like unmingled satisfaction. For the remainder of the 1820s, McDonald remained active. He advocated greater federal funding for education, the created, creation of a written constitution for the Choctaws that would provide for the democratic election of leaders, and some form of US citizenship for Indians. <clears throat> 
Each of these can be viewed as a further effort to layer constitutionalism over the tribe's ongoing experience of colonial assault. James McDonald, the first American Indian lawyer, both contributed to and reflected the emergence of a secular and self-conscious political culture in the American Indian tribes who resisted the settler campaign to remove them from the East. As a consequence, despite his tribe's defeat, many Choctaws arrived in the West with a clear sense that stable tribal leadership was an effective way to counter federal authority. And his community understood that they could best make their case by explicitly rejecting the American idea that they could not exist as a collective. Others within the removed tribe shared this conviction that emerged from James McDonald's Choctaw Memorial. Indians were not going to become extinct and they would find the instruments for their survival in the law and government of the United States. One final comment on McDonald's story and the issues back to my beginning of disturbing ideas and historical interpretations. As I have presented him, McDonald is not significant only because of his heroic attempts to blunt American expansion, nor is he important or significant for becoming civilized, what Thomas Jefferson might call a credit to his race. As the first practitioner of American Indian law, he was part of a process within the indigenous community itself to develop and sustain a critique of the colonial process. In that sense, he has a significance beyond the details of his confrontations with John C. Calhoun and really beyond the framework of US history alone. McDonald was an indigenous intellectual whose criticism of American democracy was part of an evolving native conversation about the future in the, in the modern age. It likely has counterparts in other sections of the global indigenous, con other sections of the global indigenous confrontation with colonialism in the 18th and 19th century. And in that sense, he should be figured, he should be seen as a figure in an indigenous history that is both global and transnational. He was the first American Indian lawyer, but he was not only an American and not only an Indian. His story opens up many other pathways for, for exploration and new avenues for interpretation. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions if people have energy to ask them, and I'd be happy to, or conversation, discussion. I've been asked to ask you to use the microphones because we're recording this. And First, is, is this turned on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, thanks for a very interesting talk. There was um, something um, in Jefferson's definition of civilization that, that intrigued me. Um, if I remember your words correctly, it was uh, in, in the long list of things one had to do to become civilized, he mentioned, you mentioned um, uh, having the women perform domestic labor. I presume that means the women were not performing domestic duties or domestic roles as we would say now and they were working in the fields or, or they something? were to be they were, they were to be within the household in the in could could you elaborate yeah. a little bit on that well this, notion of I mean these were these were societies where traditionally women uh, were the keepers of, of agriculture and with the long history of that mm -hmm. and one of I mean, one of the, I mean, you know, the, the, the lawyers talk about the, about propositions having a laugh test, you know. I mean, Jefferson wouldn't pass the laugh test on a lot of these things. He, he kept telling these people they should learn to farm. Well, they domesticated corn. They've been farming for hundreds of years. Um, and that women, and then that he was there to help women by having them not farm as they had been and so on. So, but he was using the, I mean, this has also appeared in the early 19th century where there's this rising idea of, America, of domesticity in larger American society that is being imposed on them. There's a very similar discourse in other parts of the world, too, where mm -hmm. Europeans are going out and... Mm -hmm. so, thank you. I thought this was a fascinating presentation, uh, and I, I have sort of a twofold question, which is, it's, it was always my impression from Jefferson on that while the United States government was putting forward the demand that the Native Americans of the Southeast act more like um, whites, the real goal was simply get them out of the way. Um, and that there really was nothing that the Native Americans could have done to uh, satisfy this ultimate goal of the uh, 
uh, of the whites, which was not to Europeanize them, but to shove them aside. Mm -hmm. So that's one question. To what extent is, was that true, uh, or to what extent would they, or might they have, the, they, the whites, have been satisfied and uh, with some accommodation that actually would have drawn the Native Americans as individuals into uh, Anglo-American society. And on the other hand, if there really was a determination on the part of the whites that these were other, that the Native Americans were ultimately uh, a people that had no place and we simply wanted what they had, and one way or another, we're going to get it either through commercial relations or physical force. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the big if. If that was true, to what extent is this Indian attorney cognizant of that? To what extent does he really believe that there is a possibility of some sort of uh, accommodation within American society? Or does he already see that there's more going on than the rhetoric of democracy and individualism? What's, I'm not sure if I can really answer this satisfactorily, but what is happening as this story is unfolding is the r rise of a racial, an explicit racial ideology that is also tied to American democracy. And so while in 1818 or 1820, state citizenship was something that MacDonald talked about and saw as a possibility by 1840. And as, as the uh, removals have occurred and people owning property in Mississippi who are Choctaw um, are being just, uh, 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 all sorts of tactics are being used, very much like the late 19th century with blacks. Uh, to dispossess them of their property and of their land. So I guess I would say it's kind of a one-two punch, that there is this, this uh, language of civilization and so on, which is, which is really what's driving. I mean, not that race is, obviously race is a part of it as well, but, um, but I think for the, for the individuals who remain behind, uh, this becomes the sort of second wave that really uh, uh, assaults them. And, and he, I think, um, well, I, I, uh, I wish I knew more about the very end of his life because he writes just very, very dark uh, statements at the end about how there's, he doesn't see any way out and, and so on. So, yeah. Dr. Hoxie, uh, could you, would you mind contextualizing for us uh, McDonald in relation to other American Indian intellectuals of that period in terms of like being trained at, in U.S. institutions or, you know, were there other lawyers from other tribes and that kind of stuff? Could you? You talk well, I, I keep calling him the first Indian lawyer because I want to be disproved, but I, so far I, I, you know, I think he is. Um, the people who were, um, who would cut a similar profile, I guess, in that period, and I have colleagues here who probably can help me with this, would be people who were um, a part of the Christian ministry in one form or another. William Apis, who published an autobiography, The Son of the Forest, in, in, the 18, in 1830. Uh, was um, a Methodist minister, a circuit writer. He wrote, spoke, very, and, and also had a very similar um, argument to McDonald's in the sense of, you know, on the one hand, appearing to be a poster child for the, for the Jeffersonian idea that once people became civilized and Christianized, they would stop being Indians. And Apis is, is the first to say, not true. I'm, and, and, and gives incredible speeches against Jackson and so on, and uh, is a really fascinating figure. Um, yeah, he was in, in the North. He was in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. So there are so there are you know the individuals like that. And part of my project, uh, what I'm doing in this book, this is the first chapter of a of a book that really takes these ideas and then watches how other people pick them up later in the century. And part of my argument is that McDonald's ideas. Um, are literally transported to the West with removal. And you have this kind of anomaly created in Oklahoma, uh, which some people would still say exists, I'll well, leave that one alone, uh, of, of these tribes there who have a very different approach and attitude and so on. Um, and, but I think it's, it's, in the, it, but it's in the 1840s and 50s that you see these ideas then resurfacing in other, other people and other tribes. You may have said something about this before I came in, but um, did um, Chief Justice John Marshall have any direct interactions with McDonald? And if so, what was his uh, 
take on him? I don't think so, except through Eaton, but I don't, I don't know that. Um, it's another stop I have to make on the, on the Eaton papers, so. But I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I understand there's a reception for us across the hall. Thank you. So. Thank you.